Open your Bibles to Revelation 6. By the way, I did check my volumes here on the set. I did preach somewhat on Gog and Magog on, in, volumes 13, in, in volume 13 of the Last Day series, so review that. If you're interested, now open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 6. We're still looking at verses 5 and 6. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And, be and I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on it had a pair of balances in his hand. <clears throat> and I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and wine. I have an interesting, interesting piece here that I, for the most part, will read what I agree on and comment if I don't or skip if I don't agree with it at all. Oppression has been a constant factor in human history. The strong have always almost always taken advantage of the weak, the poor, and the isolated. And for many different reasons, whether because of sheer corruption of power or greedy manip manipulation for personal gain, powerful men and women have made their lives of ordinary, parlous people miserable. If questioned about it, many of the former would simply say with a shrug, that's the way the world works. Oppression is a part of a cycle of turmoil and strife to humanity. Usually the cycle begins with a period of justice and relative freedom enjoyed by a majority of a populace. It is soon marred, however, by increasing government intrusion into the personal affairs of the citizenry, oftentimes in the form of rising taxes and severe regulation of restriction of employment, trade, speech, movement, and association. This situation creates a powerful elite group of rulers who inevitably amass and hoard much of the nation's wealth, living pitifully little to be disturbed to the squalid, squalid masses. Nothing's changed. That's the way it's been since the beginning. <coughs> I'm not like some of these liberals that you think you have to take away from the rich and equally share. Anything that you materially gained in your lifetime, if you work for it, it's yours. We have too many people that feel like they're entitled these days. They don't want to work for anything. They're lazy. They want handouts. They want government assistance. And because government's so corrupt, they want to keep their parties in office and their officials in office. They'll pro 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 promise to provide the assistance at the cost of the taxpayers and foreign loans. And national loans to keep the beast fed. Nothing's new. Everyone's looking in today's world for hope. No one's happy with their leaders. Merkel in Germany just got reelected, and no one will, they even know how that happened because she's so unliked. She's more unliked than President Trump when you look at the polls. France, its leader, and this is just recently elected leader is very unliked. Wherever you go, no one's happy. Everybody wants something, and they feel like they deserve it by putting out very little effort on their part to obtain it. Now, do I realize that the more powerful government and people in government and people in financial institutions that kind of run behind the scenes the government they want. Take advantage and oppress people? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. I believe part of the answer would be, not all of it, but part of the answer in this country would be four years and you're out. Max six years at any elected official capacity. You don't make it a career. You don't allow lobbyists to even come within a mile of these public officials to influence them. And you see how quickly things would turn around. But that probably will never happen, my friend. It's wishful thinking. So there is oppression. Oppression is a part of the cycle of turmoil and strife to humanity. How long the state of affairs exists depends on the character of the people. But usually the result is rebellion and overthrow of the government. The victors promising a new constitution guaranteeing all the freedoms that the old regime had stolen from them. Set up a new government. They proclaim a new day has, has dawned. Justice and equity will prevail. Our golden age lies ahead. Now, the only lies ahead there is lies about what they're saying. <coughs> Yet the wheel continues to turn. Before long, the new rulers become the new oppressors. Another generation of average Joes and Janes feel the bite of tyranny. A primary means of repression throughout history has been economic in nature. If a person or a group can be kept at the subsistent level, that is, financially able to afford only the bare necessities of life, he or it can be controlled. For instance, a man who must work from sunup to sundown to make enough to feed himself and his family does not have time to further his education, start a business, travel to see how others live, or collude with neighbors to rebel against his rulers. Essentially, such a person is a slave, a serf, a pauper, and those in authority have little trouble holding his nose to the grindstone day after day after day. Either he plods on, or he and his dependents starve. Now this whole article leads up to dealing with famine, which I believe <clears throat> these verses in Revelation 6, verses 5 and 6, is also referring to not everything about it it's famine but for the most part now I'm gonna read you this tonight but I'm gonna take a little bit direction when I start identifying the horsemen though Westerners usually think of famine in terms of mass starvation in remote third world countries in our mind's eye we see stick thin little children with distended butt bellies and bones clearly visible under their skin. Flies buzzing around their starving faces. We imagine lines of such people, bowl or cup in hand, waiting to receive their daily rations of grain or milk. Others we envision lying in the dirt without the strength even to walk. But there's another kind of famine. Not as severe, but ultimately just as calamitous. It is the famine of project, project, protracted undernourishment, one that weakens the body, making it sickly and short-lived and crushes the spirit, causing hopelessness and apathy. Jeremiah, Jeremiah writes in Lamentations 4.9, Those slain by the sword are better off than those who die of hunger, for these pine away, stricken for lack of the fruits of the field. It is such a long-term hunger that appears in Revelation 6, verse 5 through 6. No matter if it is the result of war, oppression, drought, or flooding, famine is a terrible scourge, and Sally has claimed millions of lives of the centuries. This is the work of the third horseman, the rider of the black horse. Even though I do agree with that to a certain extent, this verse is not pointing to what this rider W-R-I-T-E-R -E is pointing out. This is to a specific event in history that affects Israel. I'm referring to Israel with this K 
capital in Jerusalem. But I'll get there. Now, as I said, once the seal is open, it doesn't close. And I can tell you right now, Islam has caused more famines in the Middle East and beyond than people even recognize. Read your history. Read your history. Even though it's kind of hard to locate the history these days because everything is being so covered up and eliminated from the bookshelves to hide Islam's past and present. The Apostle John's description of this third horse and horseman is once again spare as he provides only two pertinent details the black coat of the horse and the rider's pair of scales. Both of these details though point to an overall interp interpretation of famine which first aid verifies by saying this rider has power to kill with hunger. And I agree with that. And when I point out exactly how that was done, what this points to, you'll see for yourself that to be true. In the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus also named this seal as famine in Matthew 24, 7. We moderns tend to consider black to be the opposite of white. So to us, black is the color of evil, personified in the almost totally black costumes of villains. The ancients made no such symbolic contrast, although they did see symbolic opposites in darkness and light. Biblically, black is not the color of sin, but simply an object's true color. Black, blackness, and blacker are found 23 times in the Bible, describing the sky, hair, clothes, climbing cloth, marble, skin, night, ravens, cumin, and horses. In each occurrence, blackness appears to be defining darkness. This does not mean, however, that the color black holds no symbolic meaning. It certainly has overtones of foreboding. Specifically, the Israelites used black to signify the mournful and unhealthy means of those enduring scarcities, want, and famine, particularly as judgment from God. You'll see that in Jeremiah 14, 2, which reads, Judah mourns and her gates languish. They mourn, literally, they are black for the land and the cry of Jerusalem has gone up in Lamentations 5.10 our skin is hot literally our skin is black as an oven because of the fever of famine in Joel 2 verse 6 before them the people writhe in pain all faces are drained of color literally gathered blackness in Nahum chapter 2 verse 10 she is empty desolate and waste the heart melts and the knees shake much pain is in every side and all their faces are drained of color color literally all their faces are drained and gather blackness to a Hebrew the black horse of the third seal would picture the illness and dirt of a famine Specifically, the dirt and squalor of those who had nothing. Pairs of scales translates the Greek word sugon, which literally means yoke. Yoke. As in the yoke of oxen or the yoke of bondage. The beam of a balance, which resembles a yoke's crossbeam, joins or couples the two pans just as a yoke joins the oxen. Just as it is, a, it is better if the yoke 
Yoked oxen are evenly matched, so the purpose of the balance is to determine that the contents of the two pans are equal. Today we have little experience with pairs of scales or balances. Yet until recently, they were the commonly used means of weighing substances. Perhaps we are familiar with a pair of scales from its use in a Western movie to determine the weight of a gold nugget. In addition, most of us are aware that a balance is an international symbol of justice, depicting the supposed equality of all before the law. Elements of both these common use, uses appear in the third horseman. In ancient times, the value or quantity of a thing was determined by weight on scales. <coughs> in fact, people bought and sold items by weight or measure rather than by currency-based system. For instance, the shekel was not originally a unit of money, but a weight according to which the price and quantity of things were determined. As such, scales were common marketplace items, and God demanded they be used justly. Interestingly, because scales are easily manipulated, they can also be a symbol of fraudulent exaction and oppression, as Hosea 12, 7 illustrates. It reads, A cunning Canaanite, or merchant, referring to Ephraim, which stands for all Israel. Deceitful scales are in the hand, are in his hands. He loves to oppress. Deceitful scales are in his hands. He loves to oppress. Micah concurs. It reads, Shall I count pure those with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights? For her rich men are full of violence, and her inhabitants have spoken lies, and her tongue is deceitful in their mouth. When mentioned in terms of foodstuff, particularly bread, scales become a symbol of scarcity because normally bread would be sold by the loaf without much concern for exact weight. However, during a famine when each ounce of flour was available, flour would be rationed by weight or measure, and neither buyer or seller would want to be cheated. Notice God's prophetic warning in Leviticus 26, 26. And it reads, When I have cut off your supply of bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall bring to you your bread by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. The prophet Ezekiel also mentions rationing by weight as a judgment of, by God. And your few food which you shall eat by weight, twenty shekels a day, from time to time you shall eat. Son of man shall have cut off the supply of bread in Jerusalem. They shall eat bread by weight and with anxiety and shall drink water by measure and with dread. That actually happened. That actually happened. And I'll show you where. God is often depicted in the Old Testament as holding scales. For example, Hannah prays, For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. Solomon declares, The Lord weights the spirits, the Lord weighs the spirits or the motives and attitudes of the people. Job cries, let me be weighed in a just balance that God may know my integrity. Perhaps the best known use of scales in this sense appears in Daniel 5.25 where God tells Belshazzar through Daniel's interpretation, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. It is clearly possible that God wants us to understand all these seemingly, seemingly meanings in the third horseman. His lethal power is th terrible. Divine judgment of mankind for its violent oppression and greed. And it takes the form of famine and wasting through malnutrition. Yeah, that's all possible. But that's not what this verse is referring to. All I'm, the reason why I'm reading this is to give you a little bit of history how weight and scales were used and the meaning behind it. What about the wheat, barley, oil, and wine? After describing the black horse and its rider, John hears a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a Daenerys and three quarts of barley for a Daenerys and do not harm the oil and wine. Revelation 6, verse 6. 
Among the four horsemen, this is an unusual departure. Nothing else is said to or about them save in this verse. Being so set apart, the words are doubly significant. Who speaks these words? John simply says a voice. Literally, the Greek is like a voice, which can be stated as what seems to be a voice. The only clue we have is that it comes from in the midst of the four living creatures. The language suggests that the creatures were situated Well, let me back up. The only clue that we have is that it comes to the midst of the four living creatures in Revelation 4, verse 6. Provides the answer. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures. The language suggests that the creatures were situated on the throne, one creature in the middle of each of the four sides. The voice come from the midst of these creatures must have come from the one sitting on the throne. God himself uttered utter these words, utters these words. What he says is a common marketplace call of a merchant shouting out the price of his wares. He is setting relative values for both wheat and barley, with, with, with wheat being three times as valuable, I mean, valuable excuse me, as barley. However, his price is highly inflated. The court here is, court, Q-U-A-R-T, here is Joinix in Greek, which is roughly equivalent to our court, the amount of grain that a normal man needs each day to survive. In ancient times, though a Daenerys would buy eight to ten quarts of wheat, not one. Obviously, these are disaster prices. The Daenerys was equal to ordinary workers' daily wage, as Jesus illustrates in his parable of the laborers. These prices then give a person an un give a person an unevitable choice. If he is a single, if he is single, he can buy the more expensive, more nutritious wheat, yet have nothing left over. Or he can buy the cheaper, less nutritious barley and save the remainder for the next day or so. However, if he is married and has children, he can choose only the barley because he needs more than a quart of grain for his family's subsistence. None of these choices really allows the person either to get ahead or to stay healthy, especially if he has dependents. God also commands, do not harm the oil and the wine, which is a puzzler to scholars. To whom is God speaking to? To the horsemen or the people in general? It seems to be directed at the horseman, as he is the direct cause of the scarcity. Thus, the staff of life will be in such short supply as to the need to be rationed or sold at extortionist prices, but oil and wine will be relatively untouched. Why? Many commentators consider oil and wine to be a luxury item, but this is false. In ancient times, <clears throat> olive oil and wine were staples of the Mediterranean diet along with grain. A person, though, cannot live on oil and wine as he can on grain, yet, as science is just now discovering, they do provide additional necessary nutrition. These items are available during their third horseman rampage, but the average man will not have the means to purchase them since all his money is being spent on flour for bread. What is God picturing then? The key is to remember that this famine is ongoing just as the wars and rumors of wars of the second horseman and the pictures of the first horseman are. There are occasional lows of plenty, but the experience of history is, is the, the, that most of the time, the ordinary individual is just getting by, just as God predicted in Genesis 3, verse 17 through 19. He labors and toils to eke out a miserable living only to die, worn out and broken in a few short years. The third horseman's job is to follow his red brother's devastating wars with oppression, corruption, and scarcity so that men may stay weak and poor and many die. Now, I have no problem in accepting that from the period that this horseman arrived to the present. Because like I said, 
the seal does not close. It continues on. And I have no problem with that. But it still does not describe and does not give us the definition that we're looking for of why and what happened when this third horseman, whoever he is, appeared on the scene and what took place to start the unfolding of this seal that would continue on through history just like the others but what started it? who started it? and how does it affect Israel? How does it affect Israel? Now, I'm not going to read you the rest of this because it goes on into present day Christian science fiction. Explanations. Which, as I said earlier, not just tonight, but in earlier teachings, I just don't line up with. I just wanted to point out, once again, no matter who you read really that, does, that did any amount of research and why these verses are referring to famine and how they got there, an explanation of why it is believed to be famine that's referred to. I just read you some of the information that points at, to these scriptures that if you take the scriptures in, in ho at its whole and try to define what's being said here, it refers to a famine. It refers to a scarcity of food. It refers to a point where, as I will point out next time, where e Israel, yoke of bondage, once again, not the Roman Empire, but now Muslims takes hold and they were subdued and they had to, in a sense, bow down. A lot of people, and I really didn't get into all this history, from 300 A.D., to the time Muhammad arrived on the scene and shortly after. Abu Bakr, and many have pointed this out, not many, but a few have pointed this out, that Abu Bakr, the second horseman, Muhammad's right-hand man, was originally a Jewish rabbi that converted to Islam under Muhammad. And he was not the only one. I didn't get into all that history. There's so much I have to cover in this last day series, I can't get it into all the details. But from about 300 to 600 plus AD, Christians and Jews were at each other. Jews were constantly plotting against Christians, using the Persians, using the tribes from the Saudi Arabia as today, Saudi Arabia area, to come against Christians. They were constantly at each other's throat. Why? Because Christians were, for the most part, even before the Crusades, were trying to be a dominant force in Israel, specifically around Jerusalem. And the Jews didn't want that. There were many Jews that were still there, didn't want that to happen. They felt that they were under bondage because Christians were trying to Christianize a Jewish area. Make a long story short. They couldn't win the battle against the Christians on their own, so they formed their own alliances. Well, that kind of backfired on them eventually. First with Muhammad. Then Abu Bakr, from a rabbi to a caliph. 
and then this third horseman. And this third horseman does something that the other two didn't do. Which would place Jews under more bondage than even the Roman Empire and what it did to the Jews at that particular time 600 plus years earlier. Even destroying their own city in my opinion was less damaging to it eventually what would take place in the city of God Jerusalem let's not forget what's sitting there on that Temple Mount area the abomination of desolation the very structure that says that God has no son the Antichrist spirit in a physical form through a structure making that pronouncement very clear and a core of this world's population today believe just that now the Jews don't fall far behind from that either in fact they're right there with them if I was God I would have left the Jews a long time ago I'm not God God's not a man to lie he'll keep his word and he fulfill everything that he promised for that area and that nation including Israelites not just Jews all of it will be fulfilled now I just wanted to point out some of the definitions and scriptures that are used with other scriptures in the in the Bible both Old and New Testament that points to this must be referring to a famine but what type of famine what kind of famine what purpose who brought it on and why was the oil and wine not hurt now that's about as much as my voice can handle tonight I just want to give you a little taste of what we're gonna look at next time and God willing I'll identify who this writer is now this writer accomplished a lot conquering a vast area but I'm only concerned how it unseals itself according to the scriptures and what it began and really what continues today not just a famine by the scarcity of food starving people to death I mean you'll see that not just in the Middle East but in the Far East and also in Africa starving people to death because they're not Muslim seal is still riding my friend the horse is still riding but I want to point out how it affects who this book the book of Revelation is addressing and who they're addressing and that's next time I want to hear from you, play a song. I'll be here for a few minutes still, so it's your turn to talk to me. Play the song. <laughs>